Good evening, and thank you all for coming. I'm Bob DeQuello, and I'd like to welcome you to the Robert J. Milano Lecture Series. Bob Milano rose from uh, very humble beginnings to prominence and great success as a businessman and an industrialist. He was a client of mine for over 30 years at my company, Brinton Eaton Wealth Advisors. One of my responsibilities in helping him manage his money and his investments was to help him with his charitable giving and also to work with him in establishing a private foundation which was set up in 1970. His biography is in your program. Bob's association with the New School began with him taking continuing education courses here. He then joined the board in 1976 and he served as vice chairman of the Graduate School of Management and Urban Policy. His service and support of the New School were extremely generous and his vision was very formidable. So much so that the trustees of the university recognized his contributions in 1996 by naming the Milano the New School for Management and Public Policy in his honor. I miss Bob Milano and his wife, City, very much, but I'm proud to have served today as president of the Milano Foundation and to have continued my own association with this university, and I joined the Board of Governors a year ago. I'm especially proud and delighted to have been able to establish a few years ago the Robert J. Milano Scholarship Fund and the Robert J. Milano Lecture Series, which is continuing tonight. This lecture series and the Scholarship Fund both memorialize Bob Milano's life and legacy and his commitments to education, to economic opportunity, and to the city of New York, which he was very proud to live in. These are some of the same traits that I see in Milano scholars and the Milano lecturer who is joining us tonight. I'm certain Bob Milano would have been very proud of this. I thank you for joining us tonight to remember Bob Milano. I also want to recognize his son, Scott, who lives in California, wasn't able to be with us. When I spoke to him this afternoon, he wanted to make sure that everyone knew he was here in spirit. I also want to thank our uh, Milano lecturer, Dick Parsons, and I also want to thank my fellow board member Steve Parrish for introducing Dick to our community. And with that, I'll turn this over to our friend, my friend, Bob Curry, the president of the New School. Please join me in welcoming Bob to the podium. Well, first of all, after um, confusing my wife with a woman I used to know, I have surrendered uh, myself to reading glasses. Um, and I want to welcome uh, everyone here, and I particularly want to thank Bob uh, uh, DeQuello for his commitment to Milano and for his commitment to the students uh, who are enrolled at Milano. Um, the students at Milano are uh, the most diverse community that we have at the university. And the thing that unites them is uh, the desire in the urban environment uh, to make a difference, to make change happen in a positive way, either in the not-for-profit world or in the government, not just in New York City, but elsewhere as well. And with all the evidence that are available uh, to our young people today, uh, mostly coming from old people who are uh, telling them that it doesn't make any difference uh, what they do, uh, I'm quite impressed and quite moved by the commitment that these young men and women have to coming to our school, to being taught by our extraordinary faculty, and to be prepared for a life of constructive change. Uh, two of the Milano uh, scholars are with us tonight. I, I would ask both of them to stand as I introduce them and ask all of you to show your appreciation not just for uh, the Robert Milano Foundation and, and the gift of scholarships, but for the commitment that these students have shown. The first is Larisha Franks. Uh, Risha, are you out there somewhere? How are you? And the second is Juliet uh, Yamhane. Juliet, are you, are you out there? Is someone who wants to pretend to be Juliet? You want to <laughs> stand up and, I mean, it's always good to get a round of applause. There's a round of applause waiting for someone brave enough to do that. Uh, I'm, I also want to thank Dick Parsons uh, for taking time out to do this. Uh, 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 Dick is an enormously successful and generous uh, uh, human being. 
um, who continues to step forward when asked to take on a difficult assignment. And as is almost always the case in today's world, taking on a difficult assignment uh, produces more opportunity for downside than upside. And uh, uh, for those of us who recognize that, Dick, uh, thank you both for uh, taking on a difficult assignment and for coming here this evening, which we hope will be less difficult than the one that caused you to be invited here this evening. Uh, this uh, lecture series not just commemorates uh, Bob Milano. I did not have the pleasure of meeting or knowing uh, uh, Bob Milano, but uh, every time I would ask the question, who is Bob Milano, uh, the beginning of the answer was always, uh, he was a wonderful man. You know, he was a good man. He was a generous man. He was a kind man. The values of this individual, in other words, were uh, what were enumerated before any business accomplishment or any successful uh, accomplishment uh, beyond that. And I think it's terribly important uh, to uh, recognize that because it is something that connects to the ambition of our students, the ambition of the men and women who have chosen to enroll in this program. Uh, Milano is in the process of being uh, integrated together with another graduate program, very successful graduate program, our graduate program in international affairs. Uh, it's being uh, 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 brought together by Another remarkable man, Neil Graboy, who's out here in the audience somewhere, had plenty of things to do besides saying yes to come here to lead this effort. Would you, Neil, stand and take a round of applause? Um, <laughs> take the round of applause that Juliet was going to get if she had been here. Uh, there are many reasons for us uh, uh, to focus today on the topic uh, at hand. That is to say, the status and the state and the future of of the economy in the United States. Uh, New York City will play a very important role in uh, this economy and in the direction that we go. The success and failure, in short, of the economy will not just uh, rise and fall, in my judgment, based upon what individuals in New York City and the business community do, uh, but also what academic uh, leaders, what intellect, uh, intellectuals uh, uh, in New York City advise the leadership of this country to do. Um, I don't uh, uh, need uh, to enumerate all the individuals that are available to our national leaders, but I will, uh, as a consequence of him uh, hailing from Nebraska uh, in the first place, uh, point to one who's down here uh, uh, in front of me, Pete Peterson, uh, who has been an enormously important voice uh, in trying to help uh, uh, our policymakers understand that many of the choices that we have to make to strengthen this country of ours are not easy. Uh, they are difficult, and I uh, think it is accurate to, to say that thanks to uh, Pete's work, uh, he's made it at least at the margin easier for political leadership leaders uh, to do the right thing. My job now is to introduce uh, 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 Steve. Uh, Steve Parrish, uh, uh, I got to know when he was working for the dreaded Philip Morris, um, uh, uh, and then became Altria. Uh, I don't know why they decided to change the name. Um, but Steve, uh, as if you pay attention to these things as I do, um, took a very brave position. Um, uh, by brave, I mean there were people in the industry who were not happy with uh, him persuading uh, Philip Morris that tobacco needed to be regulated, uh, that there were dangers associated with, with, with tobacco. Before uh, 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 the lawsuits, uh, Steve was out front on that issue. And I think as, as a consequence of that, uh, it is accurate to say that he made his company more responsible. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, as, as well, uh, saved a fair amount of lives as a consequence of that effort. Among the other uh, charitable causes that uh, Steve has chosen, one of them is Milano uh, and the New School. Uh, he's been enormously helpful with us with our scholarship programs. He's been very uh, forward thinking and helped us uh, craft uh, our programs, our academic programs, so that they're more unified, more coherent, and more relevant to the world at hand. So it is a big pleasure for me to introduce somebody that I knew before I came here, and I'm proud to say he's still a friend, Steve Parrish. Thank you, President Kerry. Um, first, I just want to say, if you can convince your wife that it was the reading glasses, <laughs> God, God bless you. Um, 
for me, there are a lot of very special things about Milano. And among them are a commitment to social, economic, and political change in public and private and in the not-for-profit sector. And at Milano, there is a focus on creativity, progressive thinking, um, a focus on practical solutions and hands-on practice for the students and the faculty. There's a focus on social commitment in the pursuit of real-world workable solutions. And so tonight, our speaker is Dick Parsons. I've known Dick for 20 years, and in my opinion, there is no one better equipped or prepared to be the Robert J. Milano lecturer this year. Dick has held senior leadership positions in all three sectors. They're detailed in his bio. I'm not going to go over that. I encourage you to look at it if you haven't. Uh, but leadership positions in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors are not unusual. Lots of people have done that. What makes Dick unique is his understanding of how clearly these three sectors are linked. Dick understands that great leaders in each of these sectors operate in all of these sectors. Dick's also a listener. He understands the importance of listening, of listening to everyone, not just those who agree with him. And Dick understands the importance of listening to those outside of the particular sector you happen to be operating in at the moment. Dick's a builder. He builds things, not buildings or bridges. He builds relationships, relationships based on trust and understanding. And Dick builds those relationships with stakeholders in all three sectors, not just the one he happens to be representing at the moment. Dick builds consensus. He understands the importance of compromise. And he understands that you can compromise your positions without compromising your principles. And Dick doesn't just build things for the sake of building them. He builds them for the sake of coming up with solutions workable, real-world solutions, just like the focus here at Milano. And all the while, Dick has always done it with a sense of grace and charm and a sense of humor uh, that amazes everyone. I often wonder how he maintains such a calm and relaxed demeanor in the face of crisis after crisis. Um, part of it, I think, is because he owns his own vineyard. Um, but, but Dick has that great ability to keep things in perspective. And he takes his work and his career very, very seriously, but he doesn't take himself too seriously. So that's why I think tonight's lecturer is the perfect one for our audience tonight. So it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Dick Parsons. Thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate that uh, gracious introduction. Although if my wife were here, she would take exception to the last part. Um, she says the reason I say stay so calm in the face of crisis after crisis is because I'm obtuse. She says one of, one of your better qualities. She says is you're obtuse. Things are going on to hell around you. You have no idea. You just so I don't know one of the two of you is probably right. Uh, but I thank you for those very generous remarks. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, although, when I, when I arrived, President Kerry said, boy, in the car coming down, you must have said to yourself, what possessed me <laughs> to take on this assignment at this point in time? And um, because we rushed, I didn't ask, answer him. So I'll, I'll tell the rest of you. Uh, as you just heard, I'm, I, am, I am an Italophile, right? Uh, I love Italy. Um, I love the Italian people, I love the countryside, I have a vineyard over there, I love the cities, and one of my favorite cities in Italy is Milan, or as they say in Italian, Milano. You see where I'm going here, right? <laughs> so I get this invitation from my old friend Steve saying, we'd like you to be the lecturer, this year's lecturer at the Milano School of Management and Urban Policy. <laughs> so you can imagine my surprise after I said yes, and he said, well, it's just down on 13th Street. You won't have to go very far. Ay, 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 ay. Well, you know, obtuse and not very bright, I think is what my wife would say. 
in any event, it is actually it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm I'm honored and flattered that you would think that I could uh, at least somebody thought that I could offer some some uh, observations on the current financial crisis and the efforts to avoid one in the future. And I will try and do that. But first, a um, a disclaimer. Um, I am I am not here in a representative capacity. I'm not here uh, speaking for city group or for any other entity. I'm here as an individual who has suffered through a number of these crises and have some observations on them. But the, the comments that you're about to hear are mine and, and based on just my own um, experience and having sort of, as I say, waded through a number of financial crises in the past. So what is the topic? The topic is financial regulation or regulation of financial institutions. Can we avoid the next crisis. Now, for those of you, I know it's, it's sort of after work hours already. For those of you who have to go home, you have things to do tonight, the short answer is no. So you can, you can, <laughs> you can pack up and roll. Uh, for those of you who want to hear the long-winded uh, explanation, uh, let, me, let, me, let me take it on. Um, now, the first thing I have to do is say, so what is, what is a financial crisis? We're all, we're living through one now, intuitively, we sort of know, but let me use the following sort of description or definition. It's when you have a sort of a massive interruption in the orderly functioning of the financial system, which is usually accompanied by, by um, institutional failures, by disrupted markets, that is to say, the market doesn't work anymore the way it's supposed to, by massive losses of uh, value across asset categories, when everything seems to break down in the financial functioning of the economy. So that's clearly what we're in now. And as you'll see as I go through here, what we've experienced many times, uh, both in this country and across the globe over the past several hundred years. Now, what is the cause of these financial crises, however? Because if you're going to prevent them in the future, you have to figure out what caused them here to four, and how do you fix that? And I'm going to do something I don't rarely do, which is quote from, uh, from some other authors. I'm, I'm going to do it twice, but I recently read a book. Um, this, of course, was too late in coming from my perspective and many others, called uh, This Time It's Different. It's written by two economists, uh, Carmen Reinhart and Kenneth Rogoff. Or Rugoff. And uh, what they've done is they've gone back over 800 years of, of data uh, around the functioning of, of financial systems and economies in 66 countries around the world or their predecessors and tried to distill from that sort of common themes and threads. So before we get started with, you know, kind of what causes a financial crisis, I just want to, I want to read you the first of the two quotes that I'm going to pick up from this book. I quote, if there is one common theme to the vast range of crises we consider in this book, it is that excessive debt accumulation, whether it be it by a government, a bank, a corporation, or consumers, often poses greater systemic risk than seems likely during the boom times. Right? Their premise, one which I basically accept, is that at the core of almost any crisis, any crash, any popping of a, of a uh, balloon of excess, is accumulation of too much debt. People, governments, institutions have borrowed too much money. During the good times, they have overextended themselves in terms of taking on credit. And then when the good times end, and they happen for lots of different reasons, that balloon gets popped and you have a crisis. Too much debt, so hold that in your mind. Now, there are lots of different types of financial crises. Uh, they can be what they call sovereign defaults, where a government, let's just say Greece, um, defaults on its obligations, on its debt obligations, either to external parties, to the rest of the world, or internally. Uh, they can be exchange rate crises, where you just change the value of your money and, in effect, uh, deflate the value of what someone is owed because you're paying them in, 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 in inflated currencies. There is inflation itself, and then there are financial crises, or what I'll call banking crises. We're going to focus on banking crises because that's the one 
that, we're, that, that precipitated the current global conflagration in the financial markets. So in order to understand exactly how this whole, you know, kind of over leveraged problem that at some point in time gets so bad that it collapses in a, in a sort of cataclysmic instant in time. Um, I'm going to start, and I'm, for those of you who are highly sophisticated or even moderately sophisticated in the financial uh, services sector, forgive my sort of taking a step back, but whenever they tell you you're speaking to the public, you don't know quite, you know, what the level of sophistication is. So I'm going to start with, you know, a 100,000 foot description of what a bank is and what a bank does. Because if you understand that, then you'll understand the rest of where we're going in this discussion. Banking is an ancient, it's an old um, sort of financial institution. Uh, been around for literally hundreds of years since they've invented money, so to speak. Uh, and what banks do, very simply, is banks, they're intermediaries. They sit in the middle uh, of, of, a, of a cycle. They take money from savers, from people who have money, earnings, whatever, that, that they want to save and put someplace safe. And then they turn around and they give money to people who are investing in projects or the acquisition of assets. So many of you here, I'm sure, are homeowners. Virtually none of you here, or very few of you, probably bought your home off for cash. You had a mortgage. Um, those of you who are in business know that part of the way you grow your business is you make investments in it with borrowed money. So where did that money come from? It came from a bunch of savers, a bunch of individuals who um, who didn't have the facility or the capacity or frankly the scale to make loans to businesses or to homeowners themselves, who just wanted to put their money someplace safe, get a reasonable return, and have the process work. So what banks do, and they get paid for it. They take money from savers and they give money to people who are making investments. And the clever little thing that happens in that process is, it's called borrowing short and lending long. If I'm a bank and Pete's a consumer, he's, he's a depositor, he comes in and he gives me a deposit. He says, Dick, I want you to hold this money in your bank for me till I need it and give me a fair interest on it. Give me three, four percent. I take Pete's money and then I go to Bob Carey who's trying to build an automobile plan. And I've got Pete's money and your money and your money and your money. And I've got a lot of money. And Bob says, hey, I need to borrow a lot of money for 20 years because it's going to take me that long to get my plant up, to get equipment in there, to get employees in there, to start selling my product. But over the course of 20 years, I can pay you back all the money you lent me. And I can pay it back at 7%. So I've essentially borrowed money, that's what taking deposits, I borrowed money from Pete and the rest of you at 3.5%, and I've lent it to Bob at 7%, and I live off the spread. The difference, or the, the, the clever little thing that happens though is that Pete can come in any time and ask for his money back. And I can't go to Bob and say, oh, by the way, Pete came and he wants his money back tomorrow, I need that money back, because I lent it out to Bob for 20 years. So. Banks get paid to do this, and, 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 and frankly, every modern economy needs this kind of intermediation so that you can take money from savers and provide it to people who are making investments, i.e. who are longer term uh, uses of that money, and make that process work. And it works, in, by and large, in normal times, because if all of you have deposits with me, you know, there's going to be some number of you who need the money tomorrow and some number who need it next week, but it's a relatively small number. Most of you leave the money on deposit for an indefinite period of time. And so long as I've made good loans and I'm getting the interest on those loans and those loans are being paid off, I can meet the normal requests for redemption of my deposits in the normal course of business. But 
what do you have to have to make that system work? What you have to have is you have to have confidence. Pete has to have confidence that whenever it is that he shows up for his, to get his deposit back, I'm going to be able to pay it. As soon as he starts to lose confidence and the rest of you start to lose confidence, everybody shows up at the bank and says, give me my money back, and I can't cover because I've lent it out long. That's the way the banking system works. And that's, if you don't have adequate confidence among the savers, the depositors, that that system is going to work and their money is going to be there when they want it, when they need it, then they'll come and take it from you. You can't have a banking system. If you can't have a banking system, you can't have a developed economy because nobody can ever get access to funds to invest in longer term projects. So the key to the banking system is confidence. You have to have a system that people believe, I can get my money back when I want it. As soon as that belief goes, you got a problem. Now, some of you were sitting here saying, yeah, but what about like Lehman Brothers and, and, and Bear Stearns and Edge? They, they weren't banks. Same principle, same principle. They were funding themselves in the short-term markets. They were going to the wholesale markets, not to Pete, but to others, in essence, and borrowing short, lending long, and that were, and so in order to continue to be in business, you need to be able to go and borrow short, borrow short, borrow short to cover your long obligations. And when confidence, as soon as the marketplace comes to a view that, you know, we don't have confidence in you more, anymore, Mr. Bear Stearns or Mr. Lehman, then you can't roll over that long-term debt. Then you have essentially what is a run on your bank. And there's no bank and there's no banking system in the world that could withstand an all-out run, no matter how much capital you require them to hold, no matter how tightly you regulate them. The way the process works is it works that you bring in a bunch of short-term money and you have confidence that it'll stay there because the providers of that money have confidence in your system and you lend it long. So that being the case, what happens when confidence deteriorates, and why does it deteriorate? Uh, this is exactly what happened in the US in 2007, 2008. It's actually happened before, we'll come to that in a, in a few minutes, but um, beginning probably uh, in the end of the 90s. Some people mark it more into the 2002, 2003 period, but I, I think it goes back to the end of the 90s. You know, America went on a borrowing spree. Uh, we started borrowing money at massive rates because of various new technologies that enabled lenders to persuade themselves that they could, they could spread the risk, they could eliminate risk by creating instruments that were targeted to different investors' needs and that they could sell around the world and that they could, uh, they could keep individual banks from being in jeopardy of losing investments because they could sell it off of their books. To give you an example of how crazy things got now, and most of that, most of it, not all, but most of that borrowing was focused in real estate and much of it on residential real estate. You've all heard of subprime loans, you've all heard of seconds. You know, the people began using their houses essentially as, as their credit card. They go get a second loan, they had a credit card against it, and then they'd buy a boat or they'd, you know, take a trip or something like that because the value of real estate was increasing, the value of your equity was increasing, and now we had through, you know, sort of financial engineering and new products, we had a way of tapping into that and monetizing it so we could spend it. And the notion was, well, you know, housing prices are going up. Um, somehow, housing prices are destined always to go up because the more funds you throw, there's a theory called the weight of money. The more money you throw at something, the more valuable it becomes. The more funds were available to lend against houses, houses would go up in price, and then people would go back and borrow more money against the new value of the house. Um, to give you an example of how hysterical, really, things became. Um, some folks have done some sort of inflation-adjusted analyses of housing prices in the U.S. over 
uh, slightly more than 100-year run. And on an inflation-adjusted basis, so that real value, housing prices, real estate prices, home ownership prices grew about 25, 26 percent between 1890 and 100 years later, 1990, 1995. So they grew in the range of, in, in real dollars, in real terms, about 26%. In the next 10 years, they grew 90%. I mean, the, the housing market just went crazy because we had all this money being targeted at housing values, and housing values kept going up. And the more they went up, the more people borrowed, and the more they, the, the houses went up, they came back and borrowed some more. Uh, lending criteria fell because, as I said, um, of these new financial instruments and derivatives. So now, take a step back and say, if 800 years of history have taught us that all these financial crises are brought on by overlevering, and we're clearly, you know, the levels of individual consumer debt to income, all those indicia were going up and up and up. Why didn't somebody blow the whistle? Why didn't somebody say, wait a minute, this is crazy. We're going to be creating a bubble. It's going to pop. We're going to have a crisis. And the reason is, and it's the reason for the name of this book I, I've referenced, because this time it's different. This time people have a way of convincing themselves that somehow, some way, because of some factor, this time it's different. All those other times before were because people were we're asleep at the switch, or they weren't as sophisticated as we are, we're smarter, we now have more and new and better ways of managing risk. So this time it's different. This time it's real. And basically everyone was singing that tune. And what was it that caused them to think that this time it was different? And it is, as I was indicating, the innovation that surrounded all these financial products and the ways of transferring risk from the makers of loans to the purchasers of paper who could be in Germany or in China or in Latin America, spreading it around the world and assuming because you were spreading it so thin that you were somehow really ameliorating risk. And what happened was you weren't re really ameliorating risk. The risk was still there. But in the boom times, people don't see it. And they think we got all these new financial tools and these new ways of of marginalizing and minimizing risk that didn't exist before. So this time it's different. This time we're not going to be subject to what's happened over you know, centuries of countries or consumers or businesses getting over levered. This time we figured out a way to manage it. And of course, um, this time it wasn't different. Now, one of the things I, I did and together with a guy named Dan Doktoroff, who used to be uh, the deputy mayor here in town for uh, economic development. We went back and we sort of counted up ourselves. You know, how many fiscal crises have there been that have afflicted New York uh, in the last 200 years? Go back to the 1800s. Uh, by our count, 11. Now, by the count of the authors of this book, this time it's different, they count 12. Um, 11, 12, but in that range. And if you divide that over the span of 210 years, you come to about 20-year cycles. And actually, if you look at when the crises were, it doesn't fall out sometimes, 18, 17 years, sometimes 23. But about every 20 years, there, give or take, we have one of these. And I have my own theory as to why. And it is because it's, it's generational. I mean, I will tell you, I, I, I ran an institution called the Dime Savings Bank uh, in New York, late 80s, early 90s. And the dime was a thrift and it had been involved in home loan, home lending. And at the time they were called low doc loans, low documentation loans. And they ultimately became no doc loans. I mean, the low doc loan used to be, when I first got my first house, you had to go with all of your records, all of your tax returns, everything you had, you know, your employer receipts, 14 years worth of, of AT&T bills paid, et cetera and sit in hushed reverence in front of some loan officer who would then, you know, almost conduct a proctology exam <laughs> to see if you were worthy of getting the bank's money. Someone created this sort of low doc, low documentation is what low doc stood for, 
uh, lending paradigm in the early 80s, and by the mid 80s, it was going full flight. And it basically meant you filled out a piece of paper and you send it in because they convinced themselves that real estate prices are go only go in one direction, right? They go up. If you put down 20%, I'll lend you 80% because I'm always covered, right? Even if you don't have the income at the end of the day to cover it, you're going to find a way to keep the loan home because you have 20% at risk. And that works so long as real estate prices always go up. As soon as they started down, boom, the crisis hit. Well, if you think about you know, subprime lending, it's just low-doc lending. It's the same thing. And I walked around the bank, and I said, well, guys, I mean, didn't we know, didn't we learn anything from the mid-'80s and early-'90s? And then I looked at who I was talking to. And they were all 30-year-old to, you know, people who weren't around when, <laughs> when we made that last one. And if you go back through these crises, what you find is that, you know, there is a generational shift. There's a new group of players on the field, and they are predisposed to believe that they're smarter and that this time it's different because we have new tools, we have new products, and we have new innovations that are going to enable us to not stumble and fall into the same potholes that you ancient guys did. So this is, this is nothing new, and it is each time it has a different wrinkle because each time there is a different sort of innovation or product or technology that enabled people to hang that, this time it's different, uh, belief on. But fundamentally, these are the same kinds of crises and phenomena that have afflicted uh, financial markets for literally 800 years, and particularly uh, the last 200 years in terms of modern economies. So the problem is not I only do I define it, but as those who've looked at it is, it's a problem of, of boom and bust. It's a problem of people borrowing way too much, or governments, as I say, borrowing way too much in the boom times. And then the boom times end, and the balloon, you know, it takes you a long time to blow up a balloon, but when somebody sticks a pin in it, it pops. And that is part of the sort of the psyche, if you will, uh, of, of human beings. So now, what, what is our answer? What is the regulatory side to this? Well, a lot of good things. You know, we just passed in this country something called the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. I love, you can always tell when the Democrats, Bob, you can always tell when the Democrats are in charge because they name things really terrific. You know, like Republicans come up with something like the Anti-Dumping Act or something like that. Democrats come up with things like, we're going to reform Wall Street and protect consumers. What does it really do? Now, it does, it does a lot of good things. Um, number one, it, it provides for, in my opinion, the most important thing it does is it provides for more transparency in the system. Um, one of the reasons that more people didn't blow the whistle before the onset of the last financial crisis a couple of years ago was that you couldn't really see all this debt accumulating. A lot of it was off balance sheet. A lot, of, a lot of it was implicit. You have these things called Freddie May and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that have implicit government guarantees that have huge trillions of dollars worth of liabilities, but they're on nobody's balance sheet. So there, there was, and, and a lot of what was going on in the wholesale side of the business was just um, not visible to the regulators. So one of the things that this new regulation does is it provides for a lot more transparency in terms of what's really going on out in the marketplace. Another thing it does is it, it provides for greater capital uh, and liquidity requirements for banks and lenders. What does that mean? That means that if I'm a bank, I can't, I can't run entirely on Pete's money. I can't just take Pete's money and give it to Bob and, and catch the spread in the middle. I have to have some skin in the game. That's called capital in my business. I have, because things can go wrong sometimes, and who's going to absorb that wrong? So banks have always had to have a certain amount of capital to, get, to conduct their business and to lend, and now that amount of capital is going to be increased, which is going to make it, um, it's going to be a damper on the amount of lending you can do and on the riskiness of some of the loans that you can make. The new laws also try and de-risk the bank business because one of the things that happened over time was banks would take consumer dollars, deposit dollars, 
and then invest them directly in riskier kinds of operations, so-called prop trading, proprietary trading. So that's kind of not out completely, but it's diminished. Uh, and they've created a consumer protection agency. All probably good and useful things. Um, but are they going to prevent the next crisis? Are they going to, have we now fixed the system so that we can't have another crisis? I say not. There's one other thing that, that the, the, the new regulation does, which I think is important, uh, and that is it provides for how to unwind you know, some of these large banks. There are a number of people who think that the problem was basically the banks got too big and um, you know, in their massive size, they became, we as a country couldn't withstand the failure of one of these big banks. It really has less to do with big than it has to do with interrelated or systemically important. Um, as the world globalizes, the players on the global stage, by definition, are just going to be larger. They're going to have to be larger to kind of compete and function across a hugely expanded marketplace. Uh, and we didn't have the kinds of mechanisms in place that said, how do, you, how do you take an institution that is plugged into the global economy and that if it fails, we'll pull everything down with it. How do you take that institution and, and resolve it in an orderly way? So this new law, which still has thousands and thousands of pages of regulation to come behind it and implement it, uh, addresses that also. So a number of very good things were done and a number of necessary things were done. But like so many things um, that are a governmental response to a problem, to some extent, they're fighting the last war. We don't know what the next war looks like. We don't know what the next set of new products or innovations that are going to cause the new generation, the oncoming generation, to say to themselves, ah, but this time it's different. This time we've figured out all of the holes that they fell into last time, and we've papered them over or we've paved them over or it's a smooth sailing road. And what will happen inevitably is, you know, the process of, of getting your arms around the bank has a cost. You know, we talked earlier on about what do banks do. They take from savers and they give to people who are investing in productive activity. You shut that down, you have no investment. You have no investment, you have no job growth. You have no job growth, you have no tax revenues. You have no tax revenues, you have massive government borrowing trying to fill up the hole. We have that right now in this country. Got to get the banks back to lending. Got to get the banks back to doing what banks have to do in a modern economy, which is intermediate between savers and investors. Uh, to the extent you turn that down, you slow the economy down. Eventually, politicians don't like that. Everybody wants to have a growing economy in their country. Um, they'll begin to slightly loosen the spigot, get those loans going again. Eventually, the cycle will turn, the boom times will return, Things will be great. People will have new products, new innovations, new ways of mitigating risk, and there'll be a new generation of lenders who've forgotten what we're going through now. And sometime, my guess, somewhere between 15 and 25 years from now, bang, we'll hit the wall again. Um, we'll be better protected. Uh, we'll have more tools for managing our way through it, perhaps, but this is, this is not a function of, you know, something we haven't seen in humanity before or humankind or something for which you can put up a gate and prevent this from happening again, and particularly not by, by fighting the last war. So I'm going to conclude with my final quote from that book that I've been referencing. This time it's different. I love this because I think it, it says it all. They're talking about, as I said, they much of the book is a, is a review of all the economic data uh, of this 800 years of history in 66 countries, so it's a pretty dense read. But they conclude as follows. Fortunately, conveying the details of the data is not essential to understanding the main message of this book. We have been here before. The instruments of financial gain and loss have varied over the ages, as have the types of institution institutions that have expanded mightily only to fail massively. 
but financial crises follow a rhythm of boom and bust through the ages. Countries, institutions, and financial instruments may change across time, but human nature does not. Thank you. you want me to sit over here? Thank you, Mr. Parsons. My name is Andrew White. I direct the Center for New York City Affairs uh, at the Milano School. I just want to very quickly introduce our other two panelists and keep this thing moving along. Um, much like what we just heard in terms of helping us all understand the underpinnings of this system and what we've been through and where we're going, the two people who are going to join the panel um, over the last two years have educated me a great deal through their writing and work on radio and podcasting. Um, and I hope many of you, and certainly many others. Jeff Madrick is a frequent writer for the New York Review of Books. He is a visiting professor at Cooper Union and a analyst uh, senior fellow at the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis here at the New School and um, NSSR. So Jeff, if you wanna come on up. And Adam Davidson, who's going to moderate this evening, is the co-founder of Planet Money. How many of you have listened or know Planet Money? <laughs> um, <laughs> you all should. Through the wonders of uh, National Public Radio and uh, Planet Money and the iPhone, the iPod, we, many of us were able to follow through the track of this uh, economic collapse with what was a daily podcast for a while there, amazingly enough, explaining exactly what was going on and how. Um, the giant pool of money, which was a piece done on, um, on This American Life, at the, at the, at the, even before the full, even before Lehman Brothers collapsed, explained much of what Mr. Parsons just spoke about. Um, Adam Davidson is the co-founder of that project at NPR and a correspondent for National Public Radio and a winner of many illustrious awards which you can read about in the bio. Adam, it's all yours. Actually, Dick, could you read those awards? I just want to make sure everyone... <laughs> um, so uh, I, my, my wife is sitting in the second row, which is good because sure yeah, <laughs> it's good because I get I'm a moderator, and she reminded me this morning to be moderate because I get really energetic and excited, and sometimes very angry about things like macro prudential regulation and um, contingent capital certificates and things like that. And and I think the reason I do is exactly what what Dick was saying is that. Um, when you become a finance nerd, in, in my case, sort of bizarrely, since I grew up in the village where nobody that I had ever met knew anything about finance whatsoever, um, I, uh, you realize that what it is about is making societies prosperous or not. I've spent a lot of time in Haiti this year. I've spent a lot of time in other very poor countries in the world. And what we know is the things on the surface, the crime, the misery, the, um, the, 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 the despair, is, is very much rooted in the lack of a functioning financial system. Because when there's not a functioning financial system, people who already have access to capital, rich people, dictators, are the ones who get to continue to get more investment opportunities. They continue to grow. And people with good ideas, willing to work a hard day, are just out of luck. Um, and And... I think two years ago, it started to feel like, is this going to be a country that moves more in that direction than any of us would like? Today, I don't think it's as terrifying, but, but it's certainly, you know, it certainly should be in the back of all our minds with regulation. So, um, so I, I like to keep that level, sometimes these conversations, hopefully not this one, can get a little esoteric. And I like to keep that in mind, that no matter how much you personally know or care about collateralized debt obligations and the like, this is why you either are doing well or not doing well, and why your kids or grandkids or friends or cousins or whatever will do well or won't do well. It's all in our financial system, which even more now than ever before is, is, tightly, um, is, is very tightly wound up with regulation. So um, I want to start with Jeff. I thought uh, the best way to start is just for you to respond and maybe just 
answer that question that Dick answered so vociferously with a no. Can, can regulation prevent the next financial crisis? Uh, right. I, I do want to, uh, first of all, I want to com uh, commend Richard Parsons for taking this job at Citigroup, uh, especially in a time when directors uh, are, be uh, their feet are being held to the fire. I think it's a tough job, and I, and I have to, uh, I think Bob Carey was referring to, Bob, by the way, usually leaves the room when my name is mentioned. You may have noticed he did it yet again. Uh, but uh, I do want to commend you for that. And I do want to say that I agreed uh, uh, with the central point you made about what's called financial innovation on Wall Street. My wife also tells me something. She said, stop calling it innovation. It's not the Apple computer. It's uh, m more often than not, or at least as often than not, finding loopholes to get around regulations. So let's keep it in perspective. But I want to tell, say a little bit about the history of financial crises that's somewhat as a little different perspective than Richard Parsons had. Because we have not had a financial crisis like this, not for 20 years, but for 75 years. We haven't had a crisis like this since the 1930s. And the reason we haven't had a crisis like this is because, in my view, the main reason, and all economic, uh, economic uh, facts have multiple causes, but the main reason is that financial regulation work, especially the financial regulation created in the New Deal. The reason we had a crisis of this depth and of this danger, wide-reaching, is because financial regulation failed. Not that they did fail to anticipate that there, were, uh, that there were speculative bubbles. That's always difficult to do. But they didn't do what they fundamentally should have done. When the FBI said there was fraud in mortgages, the FBI maybe didn't act because it was in 2004 consumed by terrorism, among other things. And Adam has told me they had some difficulty because the housing market kept rising and leading to complications in trying to make this stick. But the Fed could have done something. It didn't. In 2004, the SEC allowed broker-dealers to borrow like crazy and said, but you have to open the books to us if we ask you to. They never bothered to ask. In 1999, the derivatives, which enabled brokerage firms to take huge amounts of leverage and risk, usually off the books, usually away from capital requirements, were not regulated even though the head of the CFTC urged the Clinton administration and Alan Greenspan to do it. She was, I think it's fair to say, browbeaten by them and told, forget about it. We're not gonna regulate derivatives. Now let's keep in mind that in the 1950s and the 1970s, while we had a couple of financial crises, they were nothing like what we had beginning in the early 1980s when there was a concerted effort to deregulate finance. We had Penn Central in 1970, we had the New York City crisis in the mid-1970s, but they didn't result, you know how many banks failed in the 1970s? Maybe 70. You know how many SNLs failed in other banking institutions in the 1980s? 2,000 or so. Hard to measure. We had a banking crisis in 1982. We had a stock market crash in 1987. We had an SNL crisis in 1989 and the failure of junk bonds in 1989, a junk bond crash. We had a huge problem in 1994, which is often forgotten. And we had a high technology stock market crash, the likes of which nobody saw again since the Great Depression. An enormous collapse in the NASDAQ, which measured high technology. And you know what they said then, as, as you well know, uh, Richard? They said this time it was different when they were talking about those high technology stocks that deserved infinite multiples, because many of them never made a dollar of profit. Lots of justification, because this time the new economy was different. So we've had these crises over and over again, but this one was especially bad. My point, and, I, and obviously I could go on in this, but let me make my central point. We can mitigate crises. What happened in the 1800s is we had crisis after crisis and we created the Federal Reserve in 1913 and 1914 to mitigate those crises. 
didn't quite work. The Federal Reserve was just getting its feet wet. Uh, then we created legislation in the 30s, we strengthened the Federal Reserve, and we stopped serious financial crises for a long time, and then they came back. The point Adam makes is critical. Regulation is not only necessary to stop and mitigate financial crises in the future. Regulation is necessary to make the financial system work properly. That is, and I don't think this is getting too wonkish, to allocate capital to where capital can be used most productively and least wastefully to make an economy prosperous. And partly because of deregulation, the financial system progressively failed to do that over the last 30 years. We had a high-tech bubble and a telecom bubble that was shameful. People have forgotten about it because we had a housing bubble that was even more shameful. And think of it this way, hundreds of billions of dollars gone to waste that might have gone somewhere far more productive. Maybe energy investment, maybe making our health care services more efficient, and on and on. And we just didn't do it. The point is, make this financial system a productive, uh, a, a, a productive service, a productive function once again. I better stop there. Right. Now, yesterday on the phone, you said, uh, <laughs> you, you told me the answer, your answer is yes, we can prevent. I just want to make sure we have no and we no, have yes. I, we have I, tell good, you, yeah. I tell you, yet we can mitigate financial crises in the future. So if you take that as a yes, it's a yes. All right. Now, Dick, you've been in, in the finance business, I, I believe, before 1980 and, and after, uh, and, and this is a story that, that you do hear a lot these days, that there was a period of, of, of smart regulation from, let's say, 1936 to 19, whenever, Reg Q, I mean, I, I don't know anyone, anyway, we'll leave that aside, but uh, until, you know, the mid-1980s, um, what do you think of that story? Is that, is that a way to understand this crisis? You know, nothing, it's obvious complicated subject matter, and nothing is black and white, but um, I, don't, I don't buy the notion that, that government knows best how to allocate um, the financial resources of this country. I think that there is a role for regulation, and we tick through some of the things that have been done in the, in the Dodd-Frank bill, higher capital requirements so that you have more of your own skin in the game. Uh, higher liquidity requirements so that you don't topple over at the first sign of, you know, investor or depositor unrest, a consumer protection agency. But, A, to some extent, it's one of the reasons I didn't want this on CPRAN, to some extent, you know, the regulators who were, in some people's view, um, benign or, or asleep, I mean, they and the political establishment help create this crisis. They were right there during the boom times. I don't know how many of you know what CRA is, Community Re Reinvestment Act, and all this sort of stuff, saying, hey, you guys got to find a way to get more money to these people over here um, because, you know, we, we are a prosperous society and, and we need credit flowing in there so that the government was not only not paying close attention, in your view, Jeff, to, you know, kind of some of the lending practices, they were encouraging some. So that, that, you know, that, that, that door swings both ways. I do think this. I think that there is a role for regulation, obviously. And, uh, but it is not so much to dictate the allocation of capital as it is to make sure that some of the excesses that can happen, that, these, that, that when bubbles are being created that are never going to pop, that there is some mitigating and alleviating factors there. But one of the problems that I see coming down the road is if the government tries to, through manipulation of the capital requirements, sort of say, well, um, Dick, as a bank, it's going to be okay for you to lend money to Pete because we know Pete's a good credit and he can pay you back and we won't have a problem down the road, but you can't lend money to Steve because, well, we don't know about Steve. You know, Steve's a young entrepreneur. He says I think he, we're going to lend money to yeah, everyone in the no, front row here. He's got, Let's yeah, go farther back. Yeah. He's, got, he's, got, uh, he's got a good story, but we don't know about him. So if you make a loan to him, you're going to have to hold higher reserves, i.e. it's going to cost you more. You're going to make less on a loan to him. That starts to begin to feel like 
the apocalyptic view that you started out with, that you know, those who have money get to keep it and grow it, and those who don't never get access to it. So I, you know, I'm, I'm willing, as a personal matter, to live with some imperfections and therefore some disruptions periodically from time to time as the markets find their way through the most efficient form of operation as opposed to sort of turning it all over to a, a bunch of wise men who regulate how capital flows in our, Although, in our society. And Jeff, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think you were saying regulators should allocate capital. What I heard, and, and I find this, I, I happen to have yesterday interviewed a Marxist economist, they still exist, and a <laughs> libertarian economist. Um, and You have an interesting life. Oh, it's a fascinating <laughs> life, yeah. I don't get yelled at as much as you either, from what you were telling me. Um, and I couldn't get them to agree on anything, but I found I did get them to agree on one thing, which, um, which is something I hear an awful lot, that sometime in the last, and I, I think that it, 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 it's not right to say that there's no regulation. Banking is still an unbelievably regulated industry. You can't open a new branch. You can't, I mean, the amount, the, the government is in there, but as, as, as Jeff, hinted at, or Jeff's wife hinted at, that sometime in the last 10 to 25 years, the central work of Wall Street, or a central part of Wall Street, shifted from allocating capital based on business, uh, 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 you know, based on what makes sense in the marketplace, to what economists call regulatory arbitrage, playing with the rules between different sorts of regulation. You know, we saw this with Washington Mutual shifting from one regulator to another, you know, to get a more favorable treatment. And, and so what becomes the obsession of at least a large section of the large banks is how do I evade the rules? How do I make money by shifting the rules? And all right, you're shaking your head, so that's not true? No, no I would state that categorically. Now, are there individuals within any institution within our society who are focused on how do I get over by evading the rules? Even in the new school, there are such people. <laughs> but, but that's not how banks make money. Banks make money as fees. Right. And how has fees shifted in the last? Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, Jeff. I, I really should respond a little bit because the idea of, uh, as, you, as you know, I, I'm not uh, advocating that somebody in Washington tell people where banks should lend money. I am advocating that there be fair rules to let uh, markets work clearly. And I want to illustrate this a little bit to people because I think this is forgotten. Take the 1990s. There was wide, large-scale lying, and I use that word advisedly, by Wall Street analysts about the value of high technology. That has been pretty clearly documented, unambiguously, lying. Now, I'm not asking the federal government to tell you don't invest in that high technology stuff. But I am asking the federal government to stop the conflicts of interest that led to broad scale lying in the 1990s to a level that was remarkably corrupt. The lying included fraudulent accounting in company after company in the 1990s. And I'm using the 1990s as an illustration. I actually think it was a more corrupt decade than the recent one. Wide scale. The major firms, the major law firms, were involved with this kind of thing. So let, we, we need a system which is honest, which is open, which is free of conflict of interest, which, uh, which compensates bankers not to take risk and then get away with it when they lose money big because nobody's going to take that money back and they're not going to take money back, but to compensate them fairly. A system that doesn't have credit agencies full of conflicts of interest. Now, this is not some gargantuan Marxist scheme. This is good old-fashioned American capitalism, frankly. And it failed. And let's, I don't, and Richard, with all due respect, let's not start put, put a nice face on what happened with the regulatory authorities. It wasn't that they misinterpreted what happened. It was that they decided to let it go. Nobody stood up in the 1990s and told them to be honest. Nobody, and, and, and we were discussing a little bit these collateralized debt obligations. 
Why didn't the Federal Reserve know what was really in these collateralized debt obligations? Why didn't they know those were not really AAA securities? It is remarkable, and, and I am not over-dramatizing. You get a AAA security that's paying a point and a half more because it's a CDO versus a AAA security that's a corporate bond. You don't think you sit back and say, my gosh, why is it paying a point and a half more? Maybe it's not really a AAA. Maybe one of these banks, I won't make names, knows it's not a AAA, but because they got the, the credit rating agencies uh, to agree, they're willing to sell it as a AAA. I have to say one more thing, and I know Richard should respond to this. Uh, I think it was uh, Alan Greenberg said uh, in his recent memo and, uh, that he always believed a AAA security was a AAA security. He was head of Bear Stearns. Emails from the Bear Stearns hedge fund operators that were uncovered during their trial showed very clearly they knew AAA securities were not AAA securities. The emails said explicitly to each other, it's our job to find the good AAA securities and weed out the bad AAA securities. So this was not some kind of secret on Wall Street. Maybe it was too complex for the broad sales force of ma in many Wall Street firms. But at the top or at near the top, uh, people knew what was going on. And Dick, that is, in my mind, what we talk about when we say regulatory arbitrage. You don't need to be doing cocaine with strippers at the mi minerals and mining service. You, you do lead an interesting life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not commenting on whether I did that or not. But, um, but much more boring. You take a bond, you take a bunch of triple B bonds, uh, which means high risk. You get a lot of return because they're high risk. You put them together. You create something that, according to the rules, uh, is, is AAA, but, but according to any serious risk analysis is not AAA. And then you make money because you know the rules really, really well, not because of uh, you know, a market signal that's telling you this is how to allocate capital. Um, it, that doesn't feel like, and, and that rather anemic response to how many people have listened to Planet Money tells me you don't know about our amazing <laughs> investigative report into, um, into this process, but I do recommend it. We did it with ProPublica, it just came out three weeks ago, and it really details the, the, uh, how this works, and, and I mean, how, how it worked at banks, you may know, you may know well. So, so is that not, that doesn't ring a bell, or that doesn't no, feel no, no, right? I, what doesn't feel right is to try and heap all of the current distress on either a small or humongously large group of evil intended regulatory arbitrageurs who were, who were pumping things out into the market that they knew were no good and, and forcing them on an unsuspecting public. Now, were there abuses? Aren't there always? Right? But, but was okay. that, is that at the core of the problem? Not in my judgment. In my judgment, you know, I, the way I put it in other contexts was, you know, we had, we, we had a, 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 a free credit party here in the, in the United States and everybody came. Consumers, I mean, you know, what are we going to say about people who read some of the literature and some of these people who were buying three quarter of a million dollar houses on $14,000 a year salaries? Um, I, I, had, I had someone who shall remain nameless, a friend of mine called me, they live in Florida, they had a problem with our bank, and I said, well, tell me what the problem was. Well, I bought this house, and I got this mortgage, and now they, you know, I'm trying to work out, and I said, well, when did you buy the house? I bought the house in 2003. What would you pay for it? $275, uh, and I took a $250,000 mortgage. And then I said, well, that doesn't, I mean, how did you get the mortgage? Well, I refied it twice. You know, I went back, and as soon as the house was appraised at 400, I, I borrowed another 150. And as soon as the house was appraised at 625, I borrowed another 150, and I ended up with 500,000. Where'd the money go? Well, I had a boat, I had this, I had that. I mean, everybody was a part of this. The fact of the matter was, we had a systemic breakdown, and if you, if you come at it from the point of view of, well, it was because there were bad people doing bad things or gaming the system, and if we can just find those bad people and keep the system from getting gamed, uh, everything's gonna be all right going forward, I think that's naive. And I think it's, it's fundamentally misunderstanding the nature of the interplay 
of human nature and the way the financial system operates. I don't care what kind of regulations you put in place. There will always be people who will try and game them. Although I, I don't but, think that anything requires bad people deliberately doing bad things. It just requires a situation where there are incentives to, um, to use the existing rules to make decisions that are more based on responding to those rules than, than actual allocation of capital. So I don't, I don't think you need to. No, but, but, but that's not how the real world works. I remember when I was at the Dime, I, I used to look out my window, and this was in the mid, eight, mid, mid late 80s, and there was one office building after another office building after another office building going out on 7th Avenue. And went on. I remember turning to my lending office and I said, I said, Larry, who is going to rent all this office space? And he said to me, Dick, you don't understand. Builders don't ask themselves that question. If, if a builder can get money, he builds. That's what he does, right? Consumers. Nobody sort of sat down and figured out the rules and said, okay, here's a way we could create something that, and then we'll go out and find a market for it. If people are given an opportunity to get access to loans on a basis that they otherwise couldn't get access to so they can buy themselves a house, they can put their kids through school, they can get a boat, they can have a better vacation, they're there. They're going to take that up. That's, that demand exists. Now, did clever people sit down and figure out how can we meet that demand in a way we didn't before? Yes. So, uh, yeah, I, and I do want to keep in mind that something else that Jeff and I talked about, which is, you know, the new school in Greenwich Village may be the only place where the chairman of the board of Citigroup is the underdog with two sort of, <laughs> a guy who writes for the nation and a guy who has a podcast. But, so I'll shift the beat up on Dick portion in, in a minute. But, Jeff... Well, I, I, I have to uh, restress the point that we have not had a financial crisis. You know, we've had overextensions and overspeculation uh, time and again since the 80s. Mind you, in the 50s and 60s, we had very, uh, we had, we had an overvalued market by 1969, for example. We had that, but we lived through that without major financial crises. We certainly lived through this without financial crises that literally jeopardized the world economy. That may well have led to a Great Depression if the federal government didn't come in and save the day. So we're not talking about, in modern America, an ordinary financial crisis. But I do have to say, uh, I, I, I guess I, I just have to point out that there was lots of fraud in the mortgage market. There was lots of duping of homeowners. Uh, now you can just, just to that point, see, I lived through the thrift crisis. Now, you know, you could say that you have the... I don't know, Ken Lewis or somebody, give me a name, or whoever was running Merrill or John Thames. I was say, but you all remember Keating, Charles Keating, remember that? Remember all the big trials and all the big stuff that came out? What was his name? Something Paul, who was down in Florida, a giant boat. It didn't go global because it didn't, it didn't go global because we didn't have the kind of financial instruments that you could take the poison and spread it around the world. But the last financial crisis, the thrift crisis, was pretty damned significant here in the United States. And as you said, on the back of it, 1,500 thrift institutions failed. Um, now, so, I mean, I don't know where this notion that somehow, you know, since the Great Depression, we've had some minor burbles, but nothing that would... would really justify Can being I, called a something? good old crisis. I, I say we have very significant crises since the early 80s. That's my point, and that's when financial deregulation began to make, build a head of steam. We did not have nearly so significant, so I do think that SNL crisis was very significant. We did not have nearly su such significant crises in the 50s and 60s. We grew very rapidly. There are many causes of growth, and it's complicated. but. Uh, uh, I, do th I, I do think there, you, the fraud, it, it's very hard to get away, uh, you, you know, the fraud at Countrywide, for example, is now quite clearly documented in civil suits by California and others. I think there will be many, many civil suits. If I may say so, people don't necessarily always know that Citigroup 
had a big mortgage writing operation, similar to Countrywide. I don't know if there was even one instance of fraud, but they pushed mortgages to those people you're talking about, as far as I know. They were one of the three or four biggest mortgage writing subsidiaries. So the big banks were not only raising money through these CDOs and these, these sort of tricky new innovations, quote unquote, they were pushing it out the door through another subsidiary. Countrywide was not only the great Angelo Mazzillo, or the, the now infamous Angelo Mazzillo, was writing these mortgages. He had a capital markets group. He was in competition with Citigroup, with a huge market group, writing CDOs. I mean, this is quite an operation. Now, if you say, you sit back and say, well, it was just a systemic problem, everything in some sense or other is a systemic problem. But this pr problem could have been stopped by not, a, not onerous regulation, but normal regulation. We did not have normal regulation in America. That's my point. I, I don't know what normal regulation looks like. <laughs> but I will say this. Th this, to me, because I've obviously had these discussions before, this is a, a manifestation of a phenomenon that I will attribute only to myself. It's always occurred to me that, not just in this country, it's a human, it's a, it's a human condition. You know, when you're making money, which we all were, or many of us were in the 90s and up till the, the crash, when you're making money, first of all, everybody wants to pile on, but it is because you're smart. You're clever. You figured out, nah, you know, how to make money in the system. And when you lose money, it's because somebody screwed you. Um, and that's basically what you're saying. I mean, oh, it was fraud. It was this. I, I, obviously, it was some fraud, but it was, it was far more fundamental. It was far more fundamental than... Um, you know, Angelo Mazzillo pushing money out to people who didn't deserve it. And in fact, if you do, if you do your homework and follow your history, there was a point in time where Angelo Mazzillo, he was, he was banker of the year, he was lauded by all of these regulators because what was he doing? He was helping ordinary Americans who previously couldn't afford a home get a home. These guys were providing an opportunity for the least of the brethren to get on, the home ownership bandwagon until the bubble popped. And then it becomes, whoops, you know, somebody must have screwed me. All right. And I know we're seconds away from reaching a total consensus and agreement, but I, I, <laughs> I'm going to selfishly shift gears a little bit because I think we could, uh, we, there's other I, topics. I, I can where... never wait to hear what you come up with next. All right. <laughs> All right. I got cocaine. I got yeah. um, strippers and, and, yeah. and, and bikers, I and think. Marxists so far. And Marxists. Um, and. So uh, another thing, and, and by the way, we are going to go to questions in a few minutes, so start thinking about what, what you want to ask. Um, there's another big argument that I hear and, uh, that, that really now, and, and you've alluded to this, now that we are truly a global capital market, that Barney Frank and Ben Bernanke and every regulator and even the people who run Citigroup and J.P. Morgan Chase are really people riding a massive movement of capital that is really about China having rapid, rapid growth, very little savings, Europe and Japan having anemic growth for a very long period of time, the U.S., you know, lucky for us, we chose the right competition. We are the best option out there for investment. So there's just been this funnel of funds coming to the US, making borrowing cheap, fueling this, um, this credit bubble that you talked about. And really, it didn't, there's only so much you could do. If, if China was going to just lend us that much money, that cheaply, for that long a period of time, we were going to have a credit bubble, and it was going to grow and grow and grow, and then it was going to burst. It happened to happen in housing for one reason or another, but it might, we might have less control. Even our regulators, even our president, even the chairman of Citigroup might have less control than we imagine. Can I Jeff, what yeah, do you think? I, I think this is one area probably in some broad sense in area where Richard and I agree. I do think there was a flood of credit into the U.S. 
that, made, that kept interest rates quite low and enabled the, the financial institutions to funnel that credit, intermediate, as you say, throughout the economy. Now, why, why was that the case, however? Uh, that was partly the case because since the mid-1990s, we were deliberately following a high dollar policy. Um, the Clinton administration was particularly concerned with keeping the dollar high and s strong. That put our exports at a disadvantage, undermined to some degree and maybe to a great degree, middle class jobs in manufacturing. Manufacturing may be uh, devolving anyway, but not at the pace that it's devolved because of our high dollar policy. So there are complex reasons that are partly our responsibility. And Wall Street, as I understand it, was very gung-ho, and, and Richard may have a different view, very gung-ho, especially uh, being represented in the Clinton administration by the powerful Treasury Secretary, to keep that dollar high. It was not an accident Wall Street was profiting over those inflows of capital. So I do agree that maybe that is the overarching issue, even more than the CDOs, even more than the innovation, this flow of capital. But we should be careful about how that happened. It was not simply an act of nature. You know, now we're getting to super, you know, sort of global macro issues, and um, without getting too technical, you do again. If you, you have to go back and say to yourself, where did the money come from? I mean, where where did all this money come from? Because remember that weight of money argument. If you throw a lot of money at something, you're going to drive the value of it up. Well, let's take China. While you know they try and get the balance of trade right and keep the dollar strong and but support you know both import and exports because you're trying to grow these other kinds, mostly where it came from was Chinese peasants, about 500 million of them, right, who are don't have a low savings rate, who actually save very high rates of what they earn. Why? Because they have no financial safety net system in their country. Something happens to you, you're a Chinese peasant. You can't turn to the state and say, I need unemployment insurance, I need health care, I need this, that, and that. So they save their dollars. And we got 500 million of them doing it. That money had to go someplace. And where did the Chinese put it? They put it here. They put it here. Um, and yes, the effect of having too much money, it's like, uh, you know, I. I remember the first, my first year of college, I worked two jobs before I went to college, and I had a small scholarship to play basketball. And I ended up in school, first time away from home with, now this is 1964, $5,000 cash money in my pocket. That was a lot of money in 1964. I was broke by October. Because <laughs> you give a fool too much money and he's going to spend it. Right? <laughs> we had, we did have, I mean, your, 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 your basic point is right. We had a flood of cheap money coming into this country, and we recycled it. We put it to work, and we created a credit party that everybody came to. All right, so we got agreement. It's all China's fault, <laughs> and Bill Clinton's, no. Um, so uh, I, I want to talk about something else, which uh, comes up an awful lot. Uh, I'm seeing Pete Peterson. I, his namesake institution is, is, is one of the leading uh, intellectual lights in, in, in these global economic issues. We're, one thing we know is the U.S. will likely get back on a growth path, hopefully a healthy growth path, but we're going to be a smaller percentage of the global economy. And uh, lots and lots of places that were never really relevant in these discussions will be more relevant. You obviously have operations in hundreds of countries at Citigroup, so does every bank. And, and so I just want to go one, one step further. Um, in this regulatory debate, uh, we heard an awful lot about the US. We heard, you know, we saw American officials sort of jawboning the Europeans, the Canadians, and others. Uh, but we don't have a global regulator. We, we just saw, you know, I guess on, on, on balance, tepid things come out of the the meeting this weekend where the big global, to the extent that we have global regulators, they came up with their rules and, and they weren't particularly uh, onerous. Does it make sense in this new economy to even think about US regulation? I mean, what, what bankers tell us all the time is you make it too tough here, 
London's not very far away. We got operations there already. We'll just move there. If that gets lousy, we could go to Singapore or Abu Dhabi or, or wherever else. I'd love to hear what Dick has to say about that. Well, um, I think that's one of the things that makes this complicated. A, the, you know, what, first of all, you have to find your market. And increasingly, the marketplace is the globe. It's not, you know, it, things don't stop at the borders of your state as they once upon a time did. I remember when I first uh, went into government service, the New York State Banking Department was the premier regulator in the United States of banks because they were all headquartered here, the big ones, and we had the best regulators. And then eventually, as the national market took preeminence over the New York City market, the shift uh, the situs of real uh, regulatory authority shifted to Washington. And now it's going to have to become increasingly global because that is the marketplace, and capital is fluid. It will go where it can find its highest return and its least, um, its least obstructions to achieving that return. So when you, when you do hear people say, well, look, and this is why, why the U.S., for example, is, is, is playing, in my judgment, so cozily with the Basel regulators because, you know, we've got to kind of keep a level playing field on a global basis so that, that you don't have the law of unintended consequences and make it more difficult for capital to, to private capital to get a return here and less difficult over there because over time the capital will go where it gets the highest return. That is just, you know, I wish... If I could remake the world, maybe I'd, I'd change that equation, but I can't. You know, it's like gravity, right? Can I just say a quick? Yeah. We sh I don't think we should get too... Pe I think uh, Richard's entirely correct. We do need global regulations. We, shouldn't, we should keep in mind our own history, the history of the EU and so forth. America did not... The United States did not start off as a completely homogeneous country. There was a lot of turmoil about trying to get homogeneous regulations throughout the country. The EU has had to work through a lot of dissent over the years and try and develop homogeneous regulations. We may be able to do that with Basel. I wouldn't get too pessimistic about that. I think we are moving in that direction. The severity of the crisis made clear to world regulators that some level of cooperation is needed. Having said that, I think there'll be plenty of uh, bumps along the road. One of the things about this regulatory package, however, is while there are some good things, most of the hard decisions have been pushed down the road. Capital requirements and leverage requirements are an example. We've pushed it to Basel, and they may be the most important issues we face. The Consumer Financial Protection Agency has put, been put inside the Fed, and we as yet do not know who will run it and how much power that person will have. And on and on. We haven't fixed compensation issues. We've marginally fixed credit rating issues. Much of this will depend on the, uh, uh, on the attitudes and uh, vision and uh, budgets <laughs> of the various regulators who are running out of people to do the job. And I guess what, what I'm getting at with my last bunch of questions for you guys is, is life going to suck more or less for the average person going forward? And, um, you know, I, I haven't made... Now, now he's bringing in Avenue Q. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're working with them on creating, a, I'm not kidding, a finance musical. Um, so, uh, I'm not joking. Can we audition? <laughs> yeah, sure. Right. Um, so, we love the Dick Fold doll. You'd, you'd find it hilarious. But, um, so, the, uh, in the world that both of you describe, pushing it outward, in, in, in a world where technology moves faster, where capital moves faster, where the globe is, is, is you know, where, where it's more interconnected. You mentioned this generational thing, but we saw in Iceland it's also a geographic thing. If you live in a country that hasn't suffered a, you know, what we learned this crisis, which was really interesting, is the countries that did the worst in the 97, 98 Asian crisis and Brazil crisis did much better in this crisis. They actually learned lessons, and the countries that were fine then did much worse this time, because they didn't learn those lessons. But there's always going to be a country that didn't know, th that doesn't know the right lessons. Um, I'm less sanguine about the, the prospects of, of this global regulatory partnership. So are we talking about just, yes, we, faster technology, more global interconnection, we're just going to have these booms and busts faster and more frequently. And 
there's stuff we can do on the margins, but there's not, but fundamentally there's not that much we can do about it. I, 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 I'm, it's rare that I can call myself more optimistic than anybody else on any panel <laughs> on which I appear. But I am a, a little more optimistic that the major financial centers are gonna deal with some of these global regulations because it is clear to them they, we are in such dire need. We should be very clear that during this housing boom, American wages, this housing boom in which finance played such an important part in allocating capital from wherever, uh, wages did very poorly. Even in this recovery, average wage, now wages are supposed to go up in a recovery. Wages for men went down in the median wages, typical wages went down in this recovery. That's remarkable. But they've been going down or it's going sideways for the entire 2000s. Women wages went up somewhat, but at a fairly slow rate. Something's big is not working. And it's not only the credit system, though I think that's a big part of it. Something big is not working. We have, we have 19, 16 months of unemployment above 9%. We are going to ha break the Ronald Reagan record of 19 months above 9%. We have 16.7% underemployed, underemployment rate. You all have heard about this ad nauseum. This is a very difficult time. We are not coming out of this recession quickly. And I'd love to ask, if I might ask Dick one question. What happens if we go into recession again? How healthy are the banks to withstand another round of higher defaults? Yeah, I wouldn't be good. Uh, I wouldn't be good. But, but that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, right? I mean, these, these financial institutions were pushed to the limit, to the max, to the ropes uh, last time out, and they're just coming back now. They're regaining uh, their financial strength. And so if we had another crisis on top of this one or another uh, serious recession, it would obviously um, strain uh, balance sheets and reserve levels. In terms of your fundamental question, is life going to suck more or less um, <laughs> going forward? And I just, it's hard to beat Dickens, right, in the tale of two cities. It's, it'll be the best of times and the worst of times. And that's, you know, the, the, the complexity of all of these things. We started off talking about financial institution regulation. Now we've moved into, you know, real wage growth, um, the growing distance between the haves and the have-nots, the fact that jobs are being, they keep calling it outsourced, and it's not outsourced, it's offshore. The jobs are being exported out of the U.S. and there aren't, you know, high knowledge worker-based uh, jobs in the U.S. Um, to take their place. I mean, these are all huge issues, and they, they do have a lot to do, though, with the allocation of credit and and big ideas, I think, big ideas, because um, one of the things that will bring the country out of this slow or no growth period is new investment and new innovation in, in, in industries and areas that we don't even talk about right now. Um, so I think, for example, in this whole sort of clean energy, green movement, if, if serious effort and resources are putting behind that, whole new industries will grow out of that, that will create jobs and that will create opportunity. And uh, in order to get that done, there's going to have to be a fair amount of credit allocated to those kinds of projects. And so as you, as we, as a nation and as a, a global community, think about regulating the banks and sort of saying, you know, where and how to allocate capital, you know, those things need to be kept in mind. And um, if I had a worry, I, my worry would be that, that right now we're fighting the last war and we're not looking forward enough. And so that, uh, that we could both overregulate and then misallocate. All right, we should go to questions, although I'm glad to know what the next bubble is, green technology. That's good. <laughs> That's very helpful. So we'll just go alternately. There's, uh, Karen has a microphone. You, there's someone. No worries. 
Hi, uh, my name is Donald Griffin. I'm a journalist with Bloomberg News, and my question's for you, Richard. Um, I was just wondering when you said about this being a matter mainly of human nature um, and humankind, I was wondering what you think of the Dodd-Frank regulations and legislation, whether they go far enough, human nature taken into, into reasoning, do they still go far enough, certainly in terms of disclosure, because some banks can still keep things off their books. I was wondering, do you think that no, they go far I, enough? I, I thought I addressed that in my, in my quasi-prepared remarks, <laughs> that I thought there were a lot of good things uh, in Dodd-Frank that will make for a safer, sounder system, more transparency, more disclosure, probably higher both capital and liquidity uh, requirements, um, a way to unwind troubled banks that didn't exist before. So without sort of going sort of clause by clause in a 2,300-page bill, I'd leave it at that. Uh, Simon Johnson uh, has urged a uh, <clears throat> breakup of the too-big-to-fail banks because he argues that <clears throat> the existence of those too big to fail banks uh, inevitably will result in bailouts when one of those banks uh, goes under. And uh, obviously, Congress didn't buy that argument. If anything, as a result of the fiscal crisis, the banks have become even more uh, uh, concentrated and, even, uh, uh, and, and the failures will be even more serious. Now, uh, Mr. Parsons, do you, what do you think about the idea of breaking up including uh, banks, including your bank, uh, do you think it's a good idea? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, and the, the reason is that the whole notion of, quote, too big to fail, I mean, sometimes what you call a thing defines it. It doesn't really have so much to do with size as it has to do with interconnectedness with the global financial system. So that, uh, you know, was was... Lehman too big to fail. Well, it turned out, you know, probably um, things might have been different if it had not failed and been safe, but it wasn't really all that big, uh, not compared to something like a Citibank. But why are these banks large? Because they are, you know, it, they are, they have to address global marketplaces. And if you sort of say, well, we're going to, I'm thinking of the old expression, we're going to bomb the banking system back to the Stone Age. We're going to make everybody be like, uh, the Jimmy Stewart Bank in a Wonderful Life. You know, you serve a little community and you're nice and whatnot. You just, you know, you're, you're trying to turn the clock back. That doesn't work. And you would significantly disadvantage the United States, which is still the leading economic power globally, right? Um, can't be unless you have financial institutions that can carry the weight, that can carry the, the you know, have the scope and scale to function on a global basis, and that's what's created the size, not anything else. Although uh, Simon Johnson is a frequent guest on our show, a good friend of mine, and Paul Volcker and, and many others have said that the problem is, there is a problem with size. You are the chairman of a company that, you know, is, it has, I don't know what it is now, but around a third of the U.S. economy. And if you call president, uh, or a third of the banking system, 26%, I don't know. Whatever. Um, if you call <laughs> any president and say, I'm going down, and if I go down, I take 26% of the U.S. economy with me. In America, top, I forget the latest numbers, top four banks control 40-something percent of the economy, top 19 banks control 90% of our banking system. And so that creates a situation where no matter what the regulation is, no matter what the regulators do, you, um, you're, you're really, 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 really powerful. And, um, and now I'm not saying I endorse what Simon Johnson says, but I'm at least sensitive to the fact that it's worth noting that we have in our country two or three or four companies that are crucial to our success. And therefore, it's very unlikely that they'll ever have to fail. Um, They'll ever be allowed to fail. That they'll ever be allowed to fail because of their size. Can I do, can I do, you know, in 1982, I, 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 I'm sure people would want to hear your answer. 1982, when the big banks were uh, under, uh, going under because of their Latin American loans led by 
uh, city, what's it called? <laughs> what's it called? City group. But you have a long, illustrious history before you got there. <laughs> but uh, uh, Paul Volcker and I guess, it, what was his name? La Rossier from the IMF had to bail out the banks. And their concern, and Paul Volcker, uh, Paul Volcker was chairman of the Fed at the time. And Paul Volcker's concern was not so much that there were that huge, the huge number of bad loans out there, but they were concentrated in these few banks. And he was using the phrase, too big to fail. And the phrase, too big to fail, has been used for a long time. I think it misstates the issue, and I, I kind of agree with you on that, Richard. It is, the real problem is everybody is, was doing the same thing, no matter how big you are. And everybody fled the markets at the same time and everything collapsed. So the trigger can be something very small. My, my concern is a little bit like Volcker's concern. Should the big banks be constrained from some risky activities? Well, I mean, that's what the Volcker rule is about, right? You can't take, uh, in essence, federally deposited, uh, federally insured deposits and then start diverting them, not from the lending function, but to making proprietary bets. Um, I actually agree with Paul on that. But, you know, the answer can't be to sort of say, well, you know, we're going to put an artificial limit on how big you guys in this country can be, right? Um, because let's take city. City has operations in, I don't know, uh, I'm going to call it 110, 115, I mean, on the ground operations, uh, countries around the world. City deals with probably 95% of the Fortune 500. Why? Because all those companies, not all, but many of those companies, they're global companies. They have operations in Spain, they have operations in Australia, they have operations in China, they have operations all around the world, and they need somebody. I mean, they don't want to, for efficiency reasons, have to deal with 110 different banks in 110 different countries. So the, the, the reason these banks got large and, and, and global is because their customers required that or needed that or wanted that. Um, the real problem with size, in my judgment, and complexity and globality is management. And it really, it's the other side of the coin that you were addressing. Um, it's management. It's, it's these things are very large and complex and hard to manage. And so some simplification of the management challenge and then some further maturation of our management technology, if you will, is going to help the situation a lot. But trying to sort of say, well, when you get to be so big, we're going to break you in two so that you go back and you have to run up again, what you're going to have is a financial system that can't meet the needs of the rest of the global economy. Um, and what would be a true disaster is if the U.S. decided to go off on its own and say, well, we've just decided this is, this is big enough, and once you get this big, you have to sort of shed some stuff, because the rest of the world isn't going to do that, and entities that are going global and have global enterprises will go elsewhere to, to have rational and effective uh, banking, financial services. Right. We have a reformed banker next. Is that... uh, Mark Wallace. Oh, no. <laughs> the, the competition. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, uh, I left J.P. Morgan <clears throat> a couple of years ago. And now, I guess I am in competition. I, I do some work at NYU, but uh, I've always been very close to Milano, and this is great to have this, uh, this program. So um, this is a question to you, Dick. I, um, and you and I go back a long time talking about community development and, and those issues. Um, so I get it. It's the big forces out here. I get it. Generational, little side question, where were the adults? Because there are adults there <laughs> with those kids who are 30 years old. Um, but why do we feel the need that we have to blame it on poor people? Right? I mean, the Community Reinvestment Act is, keeps coming up here, and as I think, uh, I assume you know, uh, of all the loans made, subprime loans made, uh, in 2005, 2006, 6% of them were made by banks in their CRA areas. It's hard to see how 6% drove the other 94%, and yet we persist in hearing this story, that somehow it was CRA, and the implication is it was poor people. And the, and the other fact that we know is that given a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, if a low-income person doesn't lose their job, they're more likely than what we used to call yuppies 
to pay their mortgage. They're less likely to do a strategic default. So why is this? Why do we keep coming back and try and blame them for what you gave very clearly are some very big forces out here that brought this about? Yeah. Because you get, yeah, no, listen. As Mark knows, I mean, I, just a little history. When, when, when we went through this at the dime, we had a portfolio of about 1,000 loans. Remember the old SHARP program? It was called the Small Home Auction Rehabilitation Program up in Harlem, uptown, where essentially people who would put sweat equity in would come in and buy these shells. We'd make them a loan. They'd reconvert them. We'd convert it into a mortgage. They'd live there. We had two, two defaults out of 1,000 loans uh, throughout the thrift crisis because these people had invested in their homes and, you know, and they paid the bank first. Whereas we also had a bunch of loans to a bunch of Wall Street type guys who had these places out in Amagansett and, 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 and out on the island and they would just mail the keys, the keys and we had 12% default rate or something like that. So I don't blame poor people. Um, and actually, I think the, I think the, you know, we gotta blame somebody though, right? Because when there's a crisis and we're losing money, it's because somebody screwed us. Let's Not blame rich people. Well, well, what they are, I would say, I would say, you didn't see anybody getting in buses to drive to the home of any poor people and throw bricks through his window. They did with the AIG, uh, you know, bonus babies and so on and so forth. So there has been a bit of a war declared. It's sort of abating now, to be honest with you, but a bit of a war declared on, you know, bankers and banker bonuses and you know these uh, fat cats and all that sort of stuff. I, I just think it's it's part of the of the drill but but if you were looking for substance under it there is a notion and there's something to this notion that people who otherwise wouldn't qualify for credit uh, were able to get credit under these very much loosened and, and enlightened standards and found themselves unable to carry it when 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 rates adjusted i have to add, add I have to add something to that. The, the San Francisco Fed did a study, as you know, of CRA loans and found the CRA loans, which were regulated, to be of a significantly higher quality than the subprime loans that were not regulated. Uh, sorry, you wanted I, I was just saying, the majority of people who took subprime loans were middle income. So, uh, again, why this mythology keeps going, I, I don't understand. Well, again, I, human nature. I have to say something about, I can't leave without saying something about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac as well. They were by and large non-players in the early 2000s in the subprime business. They, because of accounting rules, they sat it out to some degree. They were made, let us keep in mind, private corporations with a profit objective. Their CEOs made fortunes because they made profits. In 2005, yeah, I get my years a little mixed up, but then they came barreling into the market in 2005 and 2006 to make subprime loans to catch up. So what? Perhaps because their CEOs wanted to make a profit, in part because the government frankly told them, you've got to raise your market share, you let it go down so much. Even then, and that was when they played their biggest role, even then they were the minority players in the subprime market. It was the private institutions, even at that point, that made the most subprime loans. All right, I think one more maybe? Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Andrea Pesoros, and I'm actually a, an experienced bank analyst who um, endured the isolation that they put the experienced bank analysts through so that there were the young people walking around the East Salt City who knew nothing about those earlier crises. Um, and I worked in advising firms like The Dime and um, worked um, analyzing banks at UBS, which lost $45 billion. So I'm, I'm pretty experienced. Dealing with. So could you speak, though? My, what I'd observed was um, how... Um, too big to fail often um, goes hand in hand with the power of management, as you observe, Mr. Parsons. So could you speak to the problems of agency abuse that can make large campaign contributions by way of their lobbyists and their trade associations to go buy, you know, they spend hundreds of millions of dollars to get, you know, um, um, Dodd-Frank or Graham Leach Bliley or Commodity Futures Modernization Act with the loophole that Senator Graham worked in to let the um, derivatives bloom to now being $680 trillion. So do you think that um, um, the boards of these big financial institutions have um, failed in their, um, f in their um, duty of care? Um, do you think that um, the agency has been permitted to over-obligate the resources of their banking enterprises and um, the boards have failed to really rein in that kind of, because the boards are really supposed to be the, 
that, that sort of a stopgap measure because the regulators were easily um, manipulated. Um, two of the key banking regulators are under the Treasury Department. And um, um, Regan, Brady, Rubin, and Paulson all came from Wall Street to go to Treasury and then force all the typical dogs, um, put them okay, on a leash and hold them back. So, up, so could you, could, um, you know, I'm, thank you. Well, I'm looking forward to hear what you're so going to say. Did you completely fail as a board member of a bank? I think is the question. <laughs> I'm waiting for my puppet in the news. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, listen, there is, there's, there's plenty of blame to go around among, among managements, among boards, among the regulators themselves, among our elected officials, and you could even sweep in the whole system in terms of, of you know, should people be allowed to uh, pay for lobbyists to advocate a point of view. Um, I think, I don't think that you could, you could, Credibly make a case that there was sort of a wholesale failure just on the part of boards or just on the part of management or just on the part of regulators. I think everybody can learn from this and do a better job, and I think everybody's focused on that right now. You know, what went wrong and how do we do a better job? But I also think that, that we are, and that was the sort of theme of my talk, that we're naive or else um, almost arrogant to think that somehow uh, this was this was a unique situation that and if we can just sort of understand who failed you know who screwed us and fix that that we we'll never have to deal with this again this is these crises of these natures some are worse some are better um, are part of they're they're woven into the fabric of our system and they have a lot to do with human nature and our our tendency to move towards uh, what would Greenspan call it, uh, irrational exuberance during the good times. And then, you know, that's why they have booms and busts. This was one of them. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>